There's a bottle of sparkling water. And a couple of ice cubes. Oh, oh, sorry, I didn't realize we were live. Um, hi, I'm Veronica Chambers, and I'm an author and senior editor for Special Projects at the New York Times. At a somber moment in the nation, tonight we raise a glass to one of our favorite holidays, Juneteenth, and the promise that even when freedom comes late, it is always welcome. I'm thrilled to be joined this evening by journalist and two-time Jane Spirit award-winning author, Tony Tipton Martin. Welcome, Tony. Thanks, Veronica. I'm so excited to be here. I am so excited too. I've been a fan of your work for a really long time. And as we'll talk about tonight, you were and continue to be ahead of your time. So we promised cocktails. So I thought maybe we'd start with that. Um, I'm drinking the citrus honey tea punch from this amazing book, Jubilee. And I know, I, I, I wanna give a full disclaimer, citrus honey tea punch is not a traditional Juneteenth drink, but I love citrus. So I decided to exercise my freedom by drinking what I wanted. <laughs> so well, that is absolutely the right, right answer to give, that we are free and we can salute in any way we want to. Great, and what are you drinking? So I am drinking a hibiscus tea that I have spiked with a little lime sparkling water and um, some vodka. Nice. Really uh, sweet and yummy. Awesome. Um, well, we are actually gonna share with everyone on with the event, um, the recipe for the citrus honey tea punch. And I just wanna say cheers, happy Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth. I'm, I'm so happy to be spending the night before this event with you, so cheers. Cheers. I read that it was bad luck not to actually drink when you cheered, so. I'm well, and to not look the person in the eye. I'm doing so, both. All of those that are here with us, thank you. We are looking at you, like whether you can see us or not. Yes. And I chose the hibiscus because it is the default Juneteenth drink, right? Everybody chooses the red drink because of its historical connection. Um, but I think your choice of the citrus tea is really um, good because of uh, Cleora Butler and the recipe descends from her. And she uh, was a caterer in Tulsa. So this is a big weekend for us in Juneteenth and recognizing the problems and the pain associated with Tulsa. So I think there's more poignant, uh, more poignancy than you thought in that decision. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about why the red drink is a traditional Juneteenth drink? I think it's interesting. This holiday is new to a lot of people. It is. And um, you can see, I wrote in an article in two, a few years ago that um, when you attend um, contemporary Juneteenth picnics and events, you will always see red soda pop or red fruit punch or some other kind of um, red drink associated with our culture. Um, it's particularly prominent on Juneteenth, but it's also you know, popular in barbecue restaurants and, and on and other menus. And it can be traced all the way back to West Africa and the practice of making um, tea there with um, um, red leopard leaves. I, have to look, I forgot um, the actual name of the leaves, but also um, then those 
that practice moved into the Caribbean where hibiscus um, really takes over and dominates. Um, and then when the enslaved are here without access to either one, their, their um, familiar leaves from home or from the Caribbean, then they start making improvisations. Um, we see them um, using different types of bark. We see them um, diluting with bits of molasses, which tint the water. Um, so, you know, they've been, they were brilliant at um, improvisation and, and being able to stay connected to home um, in a strange and strange land and under barbaric circumstances. Absolutely. You know, you used a word that I love and one of the reasons why I've always loved to celebrate Juneteenth is improvisation. I mean, it seems to me one of the things you get when you study African-American history for a long time is there's a great art of improvisation. There is, and I think that um, I have written that I believe that that's how we um, arrive at this concept of soul. Um, you know, you think you, the soul, the idea of soul dance and soul music as something that is intuitive um, and uh, natural to us. Um, in terms of cooking, that I think relates to the idea that they were practiced and skilled, but then they used their imagination and their senses, depending upon what foods were available to them in whatever region they found themselves in through migration. So. So yeah, that's the same creative art that we laud chefs for today, but we just haven't given African Americans that credit for that. You know, we've seen it almost as a negative. Right. You know, before we get into our Q and A, I just wanted to say that while this night is sort of a pre Juneteenth little drinky drink, I also really wanted to do this because it was an opportunity to celebrate you and your work. There are not many women of any color who are two times James Beard Award winner and who have dedicated themselves to the food history and scholarship that really illuminates generations worth of work. And you know, you've, you've used the term hidden figures of food and I feel like that's what we have to give you credit for, for really uncovering these hidden figures. So I wanted to thank you for that. Because well, it's really I'm, I'm so touched by that because um, it's been a whirlwind um, you know, the, the uh, day of the beard announcements, we went straight to civil unrest and the pain of, for George Floyd. Um, and I am not whining about that, but literally it, it was just a moment to switch gears instantly and, and, and go right back into the mindset of um, uplift, right? And, and resistance and the ways that African-Americans have had to do that all along um, and yet to do that while thriving um, to the best of our abilities. Um, so the idea of a celebration sort of escaped me. And then yesterday, of course, with the announcement about um, the removal of Aunt Jemima from package labels, it's just like, okay, I'm kind of tired now. I'm so excited to have this moment where we're just gonna sit and chat. And so thanks for, for your kind words and compliment. Um, I took to calling the ancestors, the ladies and a few gentlemen um, about 10 years ago um, because they were that personal and special to me. And I, the time couldn't really convince anybody else that they mattered, um, at least nobody that had the power to help me elevate their lives. I certainly had enough friends and family and fans that supported me, but in terms of the industry, I still couldn't set them free in the way that I wanted to. Mm -hmm. So this night is particularly poignant and just, um, it's a really special moment to say that they have finally gotten the due that was um, so important to me. I'm so glad. I think, you know, you and I have been talking for a couple of weeks now, and I want to tell everyone who's on the call that you wrote a wonderful piece for a Juneteenth package that we are launching tonight. They can read in the morning. There's also going to be an episode of The Daily. And I'm so glad about that. And, and I think, you know, I'm looking forward to hearing people's questions and about this moment. I think what's really been striking to me about our conversations is that emotionally, it's day by day. And I think we, I, I really appreciate that we got real about that. And so it's like, we were going to have a celebration, but we're also going to let ourselves 
be in our feelings in the way that we needed to. So, yeah, you know, um, I, I don't know if this is going to be TMI, um, but I think it's important for everybody to know. I took a pause um, because I've been going through so many emotional so many emotional things. Um, and so the social unrest just layered on top of that. And when you reached out to me, my first reaction was like, oh, no, I, I just can't, you know, I just didn't think that I could um, get it together. And, but I think it's important to share that, right? To let every, so, so I started eking out these little stories, these little vignettes on my Facebook page to let people know sort of how I was feeling and what my family had experienced that was similar. Um, not so much to teach, um, but just to share that in our all, in, we share humanity. And so I was down and now I'm up and I'm thrilled that we're here. Yeah, I think one of the things, I mean, your book and your work in particular, it really, comes to that place of holding a space for each other. And I would love for you to talk about that in the history of African-American cooking. That's a hard question. I know. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know about that one. Well, well, I'm gonna say one quick thing and then yeah. I think maybe I can clarify the question is that you can read our collection of Juneteenth stories at nytimes.com slash Juneteenth, including Tony's piece, which has a beautiful picture of your grandmother. So maybe we can talk a little bit about your grandmother, about her rap, and then we can talk about Aunt Jemima. Okay. And the news. So I was trying to tie together the idea of um, holding a space for each other. Um, and that's something that women have traditionally done for one another, um, is create a space, whether um, it's in, the, it goes all the way back to the minstrel tent, you know, in, in biblical times, um, to the nurture of women who are embracing one another when they lose a child or when they're assaulted or, you know, any crisis, but also in the ways that we could celebrate and lift one another up. And um, I lost a lot of that uh, energy, um, especially as it relates to the kitchen, um, because of the negative stereotype of the Aunt Jemima character and the mammy. Mm -hmm. And what I wrote in my piece um, was the fact that as a little girl, I enjoyed all of this incredible time of learning and love and joy in my grandmother's kitchen. Um, and the stereotypes of the, the mammy character in Tom and Jerry cartoons um, was searing and penetrating to me as a youngster. Um, and then as a middle school girl, you know, finding my own, you know, femininity and energy. And in that time, um, having this terribly tragic story uh, associated with the film, um, Imitation of Life. Mm -hmm. You know, and so those were two really critical moments in my life where womanhood was not being, black womanhood was not being celebrated. Those women were being torn down. And my grandmother's name was Annie, just like the woman in Imitation of Life. And so for a child, those were just penetratingly painful um, expressions for me. And, and so I've been on a, on a um, spiritual journey, a search looking for those women. Mm -hmm. um, to bring them back into my life. And the Jemima Code authors um, restored my grandmother's kitchen for me and all of the wealth of knowledge and the love that she transferred there. Uh, I have written about Leah Chase and Dory Sanders um, at separate times. So it's obviously a thought that has just not left my spirit, but I wrote about them preaching a culinary gospel from their pulpits of the kitchen. I love that. And I just, you know, it feels like, can she think of any other words to use? But I'm, you know, I mean it. And that's what the kitchen means for me. It's, it's the ability for us to build bridges between each other. Those old black women nurtured everybody in those, in their kitchens, black, white, uh, enslaved, free. Um, their kitchen was the space of nurture and 
it was, you know, that's where she applied her bomb, you know, through her food. And society has tried to force us to um, remember them differently. Mm -hmm. And so Jubilee and the Jemima Code certainly set me free. Mm -hmm. um, but this project wasn't enough for me to be free. I needed to know that it could set all of us free so we could return to the kitchen and then share this kind of relationship um, together again. Yeah. I mean, I love, I'm going to point out that you have Jemima Code right above you on your mantle place. It's a book that everyone should read. Um, let's talk about the Jemima News. How did you feel when you heard, heard it? It was early in the morning, um, but I had seen the TikTok video the night before. So I saw the hashtag trending and I was like, what is going on here? This can't purely be about this one you know, video. Um, to be honest, I have mixed emotions about it. Um, I sign, I autograph my books, Embrace the Bandana, um, because of this association with those Mammy cartoon, those Mammy caricatures, um, and the association of the head covering with servitude and limitations on women, mm -hmm. even though, you know, a chef's togue is a sign of stature and status for males. Um, so I, I was happy um, that a decision had finally been made. I was hopeful that it would mean that there would be reparations or some level of restitution for the families that descend from the women who originally portrayed that character uh, on behalf of the companies that used the image of black women as a trademark. Mm -hmm. um, but I was a little worried. I still am a little concerned, uh, especially after seeing the conversation on social today. There's just so many, so much misinformation and so many non alternative facts, you know, floating around now about who Aunt Jemima is. And it's brought out another level of our hatred right? That now people are in their corners defending whether we need to keep that product or not. Um, people are saying how much they love the image as it is. Um, so it was important to me in working with the Times um, creative team that we, I hope, I haven't seen the paper, the, um, I haven't seen the layout, but I'm really hoping that you guys were able to include some of those early images of the Aunt Jemima caricature so that people can see what it is we're so upset about right. and why we don't want to remember her in those ways. We want to remember real women that we can appreciate as individuals and accept and love them for their all of the qualities that were rolled into one into this um, stereotype. So, mm -hmm. so I, I'm, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, a lot of that will depend on what happens next. Yeah, you know, I think in the piece that you wrote, one of the things that really strikes me and it's, it's all over your work. I mean, I love the way all the threads go together. Um, but it's almost like, you know, when they talk about the mother sauces, there are these like mother sauces of ideas in your books. And one of them is class. And it's the idea that we've got to be able to accept African-American life as a monolith. I mean, not as a monolith and to make, and the way to do that is to set a place at the table for real people and all their messy complexities. And that takes away the stereotypes. It makes, Jemima less of a dangerous idea if you know that there's a real woman and many real women kind of hodgepodge into a stereotype. Right, and one of the things that was really important to me in the writing of the Jemima Code, I, I briefly alluded to in my, state, in my statement yesterday, was to um, point out that truths about black women were weaponized against us. The idea of the code is that it speaks two different messages to different audiences. We talk a lot today about dog whistles. And she was a sort of a dog whistle, um, you know, to, uh, to people who were nostalgic for um, the good old days when African-Americans were subservient and um, had 
very limited options. Um, but at the same time, they're telegraphing that this is an, this woman's face indicates quality mm. and a product that is reliable and um, stable and delicious and important and have her in your kitchen, right? So this, this confused message that at once she is a slave in a box to coin a scholar's phrase, mm. um, perpetually keeping women in their place in the kitchen, mm. while at the same time um, honoring them for all of the contributions that they make in the, in the kitchen. Um, it's just a, there's, there's so many pieces to the story that um, I wanted to make, I want to make sure that people remember that um, the name, the associations, there, there are elements associated with her, with the name Aunt Jemima that are rooted in truth. Mm -hmm. African-Americans, generally speaking, refer to people El to our elders with some pronoun of respect. We say Miss so-and-so or we say Aunt so-and-so, but we don't generally call people by their first names. Mm -hmm. it's, it's also Southern, right? It's a Southern. Uh, I think it's also true. I mean, my daughter said to me the other day, she goes, how many aunts do I have? And how many of them are actually your sister? And I don't actually have a sister. So, you know, <laughs> She calls out all of the close friends aunties, you know? They're all everybody's aunties, right? So, so okay, so, so during enslavement, that practice is turned on its head and now it's associated with not giving a woman her name. Just call her Aunt Mandy or Aunt so-and-so. Mm -hmm. um, second, there are three elements. The second element is that the name Jemima is a real name that was associated with African-American women um, during enslavement, but it was, um, the name has a history that goes all the way back to the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And Jemima was the name of Job's daughter. And her name stood for beauty and material wealth. And so how about that? <laughs> about that, that, that an African-American woman enslaved was, was given this name associated with wealth and beauty, and yet it was propagandized against us. Mm -hmm. um, and then thirdly, just the idea that, as I said, you can put a Black woman's face on the package and it speaks for itself. It just says excellence. Mm -hmm. um, that's, those are the messages I want us to remember as we discard um, the the appropriation of, of our women um, for commercial purposes. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like for somebody to talk to Quaker about how much Aunt Jemima made for them. You know, is she the biggest selling trademark ever? Like, that's a, a really important question yeah. um, in terms of how they're going to redistribute their support for our community now. Yeah. You know, I want to get into questions but I really, I asked you a favor and you agreed. And I asked you to read a little bit of a Nikki Giovanni poem. I felt like, you know, in a real moment, if we were all together, I would love to hear your voice and a little reading. And, and so can we do that before we go into questions and can sure. people start putting questions in the Q and A? So how far do we want to go? Cause you want to see if we can make it all the way? Let's, um, let's you can decide. What feels right? I'll just go from the beginning. We'll see how far we get. Start getting those questions ready. Yes. Uh, this is from Quilting the Black Eyed Pea. We are going to Mars. When we go to Mars, it's the same thing. It's middle passage. When the rocket red glares, the astronauts will be able to see themselves pull away from Earth. As the ship goes deeper, they will see a sparkle of blue. And then one day, not only will they see Earth, they won't know which way to look. And that is why NASA needs to call Black America. They need to ask us, how did you calm your fears? How were you able to decide you were human even when everything said you were not? How did you find the comfort in the face of the improbable to make the world you came to your own? How was your soul able to look back and wonder? And will we tell them what to do? 
to, success, to successfully go to Mars and back, to go to Mars and back, you will need a song. Take some Billie Holiday for the sad days and Charlie Parker for the happy ones, but always keep at least one good spiritual for comfort. You will need a slice or two of meatloaf, and if you can manage it, some fried chicken in a shoebox with a nice moist lemon pound cake, my favorite. A bottle of beer, because no one should go that far without a beer, and maybe a six pack, so that if there is life on Mars, you can share. Popcorn for celebration when you land. And while you wait for your land legs to kick in, as you climb down the ladder from your spaceship to the Martian surface, look to your left and there you will see a smiling community quilting a black eye pea watching you descend. Thank you, Tony. Of course. Mm -hmm. I love that too. And I feel like, you know, you have quilted a black eye pea for a whole nation and I just, I'm so appreciative of your work. So people have been waiting. I will jump into questions. And um, I think we're gonna start with Robert. Hi, Robert. There. Oh, okay. I think I have to ask the question. Okay, <laughs> Robert is asking, what did you cook with your grandmother? My favorite thing to cook was her devil's food cake. Um, but you will learn in the story tomorrow that um, there was another thing that she taught me, um, and that was the love of how to make pie crust. Love that. Alita asks, smell is the most powerful ev evocation of memory. What kitchen smells remind you of your mother? Well, my mother is a vegetarian, and so the smell of raw collard greens and garlic whirling around in a Vitamix blender are among the most potent smells that remind me of, of her kitchen. Um, she was ahead of her time and was um, making green smoothies when nobody else ever heard of it. Wow. And she had a garden too, right? She had a garden. Um, she dug up half of the yard for a garden. And so we always had fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, but after we lost my grandmother, suddenly um, she became a vegetarian um, and um, started reading and experimenting. And she, uh, they, she learned the value of raw foods. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we used to have this thing in the refrigerator. We called it green goo. Wow. Because it was her raw green, collard greens and garlic. Love that. Um, Kate asks, what about other African-American chefs and innovators? They'd love to hear more about people like Leah Chase that you would like people to know more about. Well, one of my favorite authors in the Jemima Code collection is Melinda Russell. Um, she was a free woman of color um, in 1866. I write and talk about her a lot in Jubilee. Um, she's very important to me because she's a, a model of single motherhood. She had um, a handicapped child and she operated a um, boarding house and a bakery. Um, and she left us a record of her recipes for her business. So she teaches us a lot about um, independent self um, about independence. Um, she obtained her own economic. So she survived, um, you know, by herself, um, and she was robbed several times. So um, I really, really um, respect what she was able to accomplish um, so long ago. I love that. Um, are there other people in terms of you know? It's interesting because you use the term free woman of color. And I feel like freedom is the essential built, you know, the cornerstone of um, Juneteenth. Can you talk a little bit about your time in Texas? Well, uh, my time in Texas was actually the first time that I um, uh, learned about Juneteenth. So we did not um, celebrate in California. Um, and I assumed at that time, I didn't think very many people did um, outside of the state. 
Um, I have since been told that that's not true, but that's what it seemed like then. Um, that's the reason I wrote the story about it. I wanted to know more. Um, being that close to Galveston where the slaves learned that they were free um, was quite an experience to make that trek and just get a sense of their space. Um, one thing that was really um, special for me living in Texas was my first exposure to um, life in the South, West. Um, you know, the South ends uh, geographically in Austin, Texas. It's when the topography changes. So even though most people say Texas is, ends, uh, that the South ends in East Texas and certainly not past Houston, um, there are vestiges of Southernness in Austin. And um, so I learned so much about um, the culture of barbecue and how different Texas barbecue is from Southern style barbecue. Um, I learned about the um, Underground Railroad that went into Mexico um, and created an entire community of black Mexicans um, rather than the migration pattern that we tend to you know, focus on all of the time, which is North, Northeast primarily. So, so there was a lot of um, history for me, a lot of learning of history. Um, all, Texas was also where I um, first got the bug to restore a historic property. Mm -hmm. I had access to um, a house that was associated with the first historically black college in the region. Mm -hmm. And it was the la one of the last original buildings it was where the um, female dorm was such as it was at the time. Um, and the, I did all kinds of research and discovered that the young women who lived there had these dinners to help raise money for their work. Um, and I really hoped that I would be able to um, house my 501c3 nonprofit there. I, I have this vision, it started there, that I would be able to bring us all together using food um, as a way to reconcile and increase and improve our tolerance for one another. Um, and I just thought if I had this old house, um, I could do it in, in there and um, it didn't work out. Um, so now I'm working on that here. Love that, love that. Um, we have a person calling in from Brazil. Oh, Karen, wow. And she's asking, um, how do you feel about the fact that it's been said that Aunt Jemima, that I guess she means um, the company uses prison labor to make their products? I, I don't know about that. I, I don't know about that. Um, I, you know, the, the uh, product and manufacturing are not my area of expertise, um, but I, I think that that's abominable if they are doing that. Um, and there are companies that had that history because once we were um, emancipated, um, there were provisions that allowed, you know, I mean, that's how we get the prison to pipeline prison pipeline uh, problem um, because people were allowed to use black people um, for labor um, if they had committed a crime. Right. And, and they also did that for business purposes. Right. You know, I think one of the things that we talked a lot about in this package that we worked on is how the Emancipation Proclamation wasn't, was only a, a transference of a kind of freedom, not, which is a complicated arc and conversation. Um, a lot of people are putting in questions. We love them, please keep them coming. I'm gonna to try to get to as many as I can. Um, Tara asked, how should white non-black Americans celebrate Juneteenth too? Is this appropriation or is this appropriation or is it a respectful celebration of the rightful freedom of our fellow Americans? How do you feel I about that? I love that answer, uh, the, the latter. Um, I try desperately to avoid conversations of appropriation and um, through Jubilee, as a matter of fact, I have encouraged and invited people to, to make the recipes your own. Um, and so with attribution, right? So I give attribution and name who the cook is that I obtained the recipes from. And I want you to be able to say, you changed the recipe, but you refer back to 
the original author. And I would love for us to do the same thing with the holiday, right? To celebrate in a way that is comfortable for your family, learn something, read, um, look on your bookshelves. A friend of mine said to me earlier and see if you have any books that have people of color in them. And this weekend has been earmarked as a time to buy two black books, if you, certainly if you don't. Um, and so there are lists floating all around the internet um, with recommendations. So you can buy children's books or cookbooks or history books, but, but become informed so that we can come together um, as individuals and treat each other with love and respect, even on this holiday, especially on this holiday. Yeah, I think tomorrow is such a great opportunity for people to dive into what they don't know. And, right. and I think in Jubilee, we're all free. Yes. And so I do not want to diminish from African Americans that this is our freedom. I have heard a lot of conversation about July 4th is for white people and <laughs> June 19th is for black people. I, I am not, I, I, that's not my, my lane. Uh, I just want us all, especially if it becomes a national holiday or as more corporations are offering it as a holiday, to spend it in reverence and, and gaining knowledge um, and certainly celebrate with, with African-American foods. Uh, I wrote a story that's circulating. Um, it was published in the Austin Chronicle, if you can't find it, and it lists the classic foods that would have been eaten um, by the formerly enslaved um, during those first Juneteenth celebrations in Texas. Do you, want, do you want to give us a couple of examples of that, just for people who? Um, are sure. They they had picnics um, largely. Um, there was always a long table that was spread with fried chicken and barbecue pit cooked barbecue. Um, there were lots of desserts apparently, um, watermelon. Um, which, by the way, is one of the most healthy things you can eat. Um, so we can stop. Uh, being afraid of eating watermelon in public. Um, color, dark green, leafy greens, so greens, potato salad, mm -hmm. picnic food. Love that. Um, there's a question from Christine and she asks, was there a barbecue cooking tradition in Africa that was brought over in the Middle Passage? I don't um, know. I'm going to defer that question because Adrian Miller is writing a book and he's unearthing um, new information. And so if I try to speak on it now, um, it will either not be well understood, it'll be out of context. I understand. Um, okay, I think we have time for two more questions. And one of the questions that someone asked, Garlic Granola, screen name, asks, do you have vegan recommendations for traditional Southern American cooking? Oh, sure. Um, my uh, niece is a uh, vegan. My mother is a pescatarian and my youngest son is uh, moving towards vegetarianism. So um, I use um, smoked paprika. The, the, lar the greatest um, suggestion I can give is to use smoked paprika in all of the place, most of the places where um, smoked meat is recommended. So I saute a lot, a lot, a lot of um, aromatic vegetables. Um, for my greens or for my okra or any of my green vegetables um, and season with smoked paprika so that you get that, that, um, that wonderful aroma that you'll miss from not having the smoked meat. That's a great tip. Um, okay, Hannah asked, if you were to learn to cook a classic cuisine, such as French food, you might learn to cook an omelet. What would be canonical recipes in African-American food ways? Um, it's a hard one. <laughs> it's a hard one. Um, so there are several, um, but let's say making gumbo. Okay. Because gumbo is improvisational. It does require you to understand some, some basics of classic cooking, making a roux um, or thickening with okra, which is an Af West African ingredient. Um, and, but there are so many interpretations and ways that one can make it your own. There are gumbos in the Carolina Low Country, you know, fish stews, um, but there are also those in Louisiana and the ways that we ate them in Southern California are different than both. So, so I think gumbo is one of those static dishes that m migrated um, in places where you have a lot of seafood. Um, they're very rich in, in crab and 
oysters and shrimp, but in the in more landlocked regions, then you might have turkey gumbo, chicken and sausage gumbo. So, so you can make it your own. You can make it your own and still be um, still be faithful to the culture. Great. Well, thank you so much, Tony, for being here. I just want to hold up your book. I want people to read it and love it as much as so many of us do. Thank you for tonight for our next cooking happy hour on June 25th at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Join Times Food correspondent Kim Severson and special guests Deborah Von Van Trees and John Birdsall as they explore a complex question, which is what is queer food? Okay. To find out more about our full slate of digital events, please visit timesevents.nytimes.com. And finally, we wanna give a special thank you to all our subscribers. You make our work possible. We look forward to speaking with you again, Tony. Thank you for having me. Cheers, everybody. Happy Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth. Can you say that? <laughs> Bye. <Yeah. laughs>